Jacksonville, Florida, March 2007. It was late March of 2007 when I saw it. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you. It's just that I've got to share it with somebody. Anybody. I figured maybe if more people knew about it, well, maybe someday there might be some real answers. That has to count for something. It might one day even save some lives. Who knows? Maybe they'll collect other encounters about it. So, here goes. I was just a kid when it happened. We were in the middle of soccer practice. It was a late, sunny afternoon, but nothing too blinding. This was back when I was still dreaming of going to Berkeley. One of my teammates kicked the ball really hard. I started for it, but the ball sailed straight over my head and out of the park, across the street, and into a cluster of tightly woven trees. It was weird it would land there because most of the land around the park was grassy and open, but I just dismissed it and I glanced from side to side in case there was any incoming traffic. The streets surrounding the park weren't overly busy. I watched as one car, a common sedan in navy blue, passed by. Everybody was impatient for me to get the ball, and so I just shrugged and crossed the street. I could see greenery to my right. And as I jogged across the hot pavement, that's when I saw it. My teammates were much too far away to see anything. But right behind the ball, something was moving. Something big. I honestly thought it was a stray dog at first. Anyone would have if they had seen it, too. The dark, fluffy head of rust-colored fur could have easily belonged to a Malamute or even a long-haired German shepherd. It could have even been a cross of the two, I suppose. I watched as the canine's nose wrinkled up and down, taking in each of the scents of the soccer ball. I watched in fascination as it continued to lean closer. And since I liked dogs, I stupidly called over to it, thinking it was friendly. But that's when it happened. The dog glanced up at me, and it began to stand up on its hind legs. I remember the impossibly long shadow as it fell over me. This thing must have easily been twice my size. Whatever its true height was, I was scared, and I'm not exactly the type that's scared easily. Yet in that moment, I could feel the blood drain from my skin as the dreaded creature stared me down with soul-piercing gaze. The yellow eyes were burning embers of something. Something almost human was staring straight through me, almost like it was judging whether or not to let me go. I couldn't pry myself away. Its gaze was absolutely mesmerizing. And there was a dangerous sort of intelligence reflecting back from deep within its eyes something far older and much more mysterious than its furry predecessors. I stayed where I was for what seemed like a long time. There really wasn't anywhere I could go, to be honest. I wasn't sure how fast the creature could run, but I was willing to bet that it was a lot faster than me. I was in good shape. I was a kid. But with legs that long, there was no way I could even stand a chance. The thing's stride had to have been more than likely two to three times mine, and I would imagine it closing the gap between us in a mere heartbeat. The creature then let out a low, guttural growl. It rumbled out like a curious warning, but it didn't sound anything like a dog should have sounded. It was almost like there were two different vocal cords, and whatever that thing was, it didn't like me. Now that was fine with me, I didn't much like it either. I couldn't tell its gender in the shadow between the cluster of trees, but it didn't really matter. I bravely reached out with my trembling arm and I pointed toward the ball, and then I watched as the thing used one of its massive clawed paws with nails, reach out, and gave a mighty swing. The ball shot out like a slingshot. I immediately made a dash for it. As I moved, I kept a close eye on the thing and watched at the same time as the ball sailed high over my head. And then it landed. The ball bounced once, and it shot forward into the grassy area. I was breathing hard as I picked it up, and then, in sheer curiosity, I turned to glance once more at the beast. To my great surprise, it was already gone. I scanned the horizon for any sign of life, but there was none. 
My teammates were now shouting loudly from somewhere behind me, and yet I had not paid them any attention. I was too wrapped up in my own thoughts. Eventually I gave up on the hopes that I might one day see that thing again. Whatever it was, it was long gone. I hurried and took the soccer ball back to my teammates where I immediately shared the story with them. They all looked at me like I was crazy. I kind of thought I had lost it too there for a moment. They figured I was just making an excuse for why it took me so long. In the end, I never did see that thing again, although I went back a few times to that same soccer field and looked. Maybe it was just passing through the area. Like some sort of a wandering gypsy? After all, I now believe that anything is possible. Though I think the real question is, what does everybody else think? Outside Nashville, Tennessee, 2019, I was on a road trip with my friends through a remote stretch of countryside. We were driving from Nashville to Manchester, Tennessee, late into the night on our way to a weekend music festival. We were excited and enjoying the freedom of the open road. As we cruised along the deserted highway, a sense of unease began to settle in. Each one of us sensed it. The atmosphere seemed different, and even the lights seemed to be flickering differently. It also felt as if something was watching us from the shadows. We dismissed it as mere paranoia, blaming it on tiredness and the isolation of the surroundings. Little did we know, our skepticism was about to be shattered. As our headlights pierced through the darkness, we rounded a bend as they revealed an iridescent, almost glowing figure standing motionless by the roadside. The sight of it sent a jolt of adrenaline through our veins, causing our hearts to pound in our chests. We couldn't tear our eyes away from the sight of it. It captivated and horrified us all at once. The reptilian creature towered over us with its scaly body shimmering under the glow of the headlights, and its skin appeared weathered, ancient, wet like a relic from a primordial era. Every movement it made was deliberate and precise, as if it were a master predator assessing its prey. The creature's head resembled that of a fearsome dinosaur with a long snout adorned with rows of serrated teeth, and its slitted, fiery eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity, seemingly reflecting the depths of a sinister intelligence. The air grew colder, as if its mere presence sucked the warmth from our surroundings. Frozen in fear, we watched as the reptilian creature shifted its weight, its muscles rippling beneath its scaly exterior, and the moonlight cast eerie shadows across its frame, emphasizing the power and the menace it possessed. We were acutely aware of our vulnerability, trapped in the confines of our vehicle with this creature from the depths of a legend. Suddenly, the creature emitted a chilling hiss, its elongated tongue flicking out between its sharp teeth. The sound seemed to reverberate through our very souls, filling the night with an undeniable sense of dread. Summoning every ounce of courage, I slammed the car into reverse, tires screeching against the asphalt, adrenaline coursing through our veins as we raced backward, putting distance between ourselves and the creature. The creature then let out a piercing screech, a sound that would haunt our nightmares for years to come. As we sped away, the creature disappeared into the shadows, its presence lingering in the air like a threat. Our hearts pounded in our chests. The gravity of the encounter was sinking in as we realized the enormity of what we had just witnessed. We had come face to face with an entity that defied all logical explanation. Word of our encounter spread like wildfire, drawing attention from paranormal enthusiasts and skeptics alike. Some dismissed our story as a fabrication, an elaborate hoax designed to generate attention. Others, however, listened intently, sharing their own encounters with reptilian beings and validating our experience. In the aftermath, we found ourselves grappling with a profound sense of awe and terror. The encounter shattered our perception of reality, leaving us with more questions than answers. We delved into research, seeking accounts of similar encounters throughout history, and we're astounded by the wealth of testimonies 
that sounded just like ours. To this day, we carry the weight of that encounter, forever changed by the knowledge that there are beings lurking in the shadows, creatures from a realm beyond our comprehension. Our encounter with the reptilian creature serves as a chilling reminder that the boundaries of our world are far more mysterious and perilous than we could ever imagine. Waco, Texas, July 2017. I'm a personal assistant in Waco, Texas. It's a great place to live, and if you're looking for some awesome weather and outdoor adventure, this is definitely the place. On that day, I was planning to do just that, head out for a hike after work. I had just finished up meeting with a few clients, and my day ended a bit early, so I completely called it a day. I was planning to meet my friend Susan at a nearby trailhead, and we were going to do a late afternoon hike. I went back to the office, changed my clothes, and called her to let her know I was ready when she was. It would take us both about 20 minutes to get to the park, and when I got there, she was already waiting for me in the parking lot. We walked our normal loop through the park, starting off on one of our favorite trails. As I look back on it, in retrospect, I remember that something didn't seem right that day. But at the time, I just pushed those thoughts out of my head and distracted myself by talking. She and I were deep in conversation. At one point, we stopped and looked at each other as this crazy noise cut through the air. It was a noise unlike anything either of us had heard before. We stood there listening for a few minutes, but when it didn't happen again, we continued on. We eventually ended up at a nice clearing and we stopped to have a bite to eat. We made sure to take out trash with us so as not to litter, but it always did make me nervous that opening food could attract animals to us. We continued our walk and everything was still and quiet, which was really peaceful. Looking back, there were no forest sounds at all, though, which, what I know now, makes sense. From there, we hiked a bit further, but made sure we didn't stay too long since it was getting close to sunset, and it would be easy to get lost in this area of the park after nightfall. We started back toward the car, talking about how the next time we should think about making it an overnight, and right then, we heard the shrill scream again. But just like before, it didn't repeat itself. Even still, the sound of it made me nervous, and we picked up our pace a bit and continued to head back the way we had come. Now it was dusk, and Susan pointed out what she thought might be an eagle's nest high above in the trees. Luckily, I had my zoom lens with me so we could get a better look. Sure enough, it was. She was really into looking at it, but I was still feeling creeped out by the screams we had heard, and told her I wanted to keep moving along back to the car. So then, as we headed back, we began to smell something foul coming from the path ahead of us. We were walking into it. She said it was probably just a skunk, but this did not smell like a skunk to me. It was a really foul odor. I was thinking it could be a fox, deer, or even coyote carcass. We made a left turn at the fork in the path, and we spotted the huge dead tree. That was our landmarker, so we knew we were close and on the final path that would take us back to our cars. This is when I noticed that something wasn't right. I felt a change in the air, and all of the movement in the forest stopped and got quiet. Susan also noticed it and even made mention of how the air seemed to change. Now my brain was getting all frazzled and I kept thinking of horror stories in my head. We literally started jogging at this point and reached a clearing in the woods when we heard more sounds. They were so loud and so obvious with all the other silence in the woods, but these noises sounded like branches snapping off from trees, as if they were being pushed over by something coming closer to us. We looked around, and then that's when we saw it. We both saw it. The thing was eight or nine feet tall with mangy fur all over its body and it had the head of a German shepherd, or maybe a wolf, but the body of a man, and the eyes glowed yellow, and it was snarling at us with fangs like something from a horror movie. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't understand what I was seeing. Susan grabbed me and pulled me behind a tree to hide, but it was too late. 
The creature had seen us, and it was coming at us, running as fast as anything. Luckily, Susan always carries mace with her. She aimed it and sprayed it towards the creature. It startled the creature, which then reared up its head and let out the shrill scream, the exact scream that we had already heard twice. I was completely frozen in my tracks. I was sure we were about to be attacked. But before I could say or do anything, the creature turned off the path and fled into the woods. Needless to say, Susan and I were speechless. All we could do was look at each other until she yelled to run, and we both bolted to our cars. We both later agreed that we feel we had been lucky to escape with our lives. I was never a believer of monsters before, but this changed me completely. Now that experience happened almost five years ago, and it still haunts me to this day. Susan and I still go hiking, but we haven't been back to that area since that incident. She actually now carries a pistol, and we never go hiking close to dusk or dawn. We've both been reading up on this and trying to figure it all out. We read folklore about Michigan and the things that exist there. I thought it was all hogwash, but when I saw this creature, that thing we saw, with my own eyes and experienced it running towards us, I became a believer. Yosemite National Park, 2019. As a seasoned hiker and avid nature enthusiast, I've spent countless hours exploring the rugged terrain of national parks across the country, but nothing could have prepared me for the encounter I had in the heart of the remote wilderness of Yosemite National Park. My name is Emily, and I've always been drawn to the outdoors. Growing up, I spent most of my summers camping and hiking with my family. And then as I got older, I started taking solo trips to some of the most remote and untouched places in the country. I was always on the lookout for new trails to explore and new creatures to discover. Yosemite was one of my favorite places to travel to and hike, with its towering granite cliffs, cascading waterfalls, and ancient forests. On this particular trip, I had planned to spend a week hiking in the backcountry camping in remote spots, and immersing myself in the natural beauty of the park. I had been hiking for several days and had already seen a variety of wildlife, including black bears, mountain lions, and even a family of elusive gray wolves. But on the fourth day of my trip, I stumbled upon something that left me completely baffled. I had set up camp near a small creek and as I was gathering firewood, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see a strange creature emerge from the bushes, just a few feet away from me. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. The creature stood about four feet tall, with a thin, wiry body covered in matted brown fur. Its arms were long and spindly, and it had this narrow face with sharp, pointed teeth and its eyes were large, and they had this green luminescence that seemed to glow in the dim light of the forest. The creature did not seem to be aggressive, but it was clear that it was interested in me. I'm guessing that it didn't even know enough to be afraid. It watched me for a moment, cocking its head slowly by lifting one ear up to the sky, and then the other, back and forth. After about a minute of doing this, it then turned and vanished back into the woods. As the creature disappeared, I just stood there, well aware that I had just seen something truly unique, something that few people would ever have the chance to witness. Despite my excitement, I also felt this creeping sense of unease. The creature had seemed curious, but cautious, and I couldn't help but wonder if there were more of them and if they could become dangerous. I knew that I needed to be careful, especially since I was deep in the backcountry with nobody else around. I spent the rest of the night huddled in my tent, listening to the sounds of the forest outside. Every rustle in the bushes made my heart race, and now I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, watching me. The next morning I woke up early and I set out on the trail determined to find any clues that would help me identify the mysterious creature. I searched for hours, scanning the trees and the bushes for any sign of movement, but I came up empty-handed. 
As the sun began to set, I reluctantly made my way back to my campsite. I was disappointed that I hadn't found any leads, but I was also relieved to be back in the safety of the tent. That night, I dreamed about the creature. In my dream, it was larger than life, looming over me with its glowing green eyes and razor-sharp teeth. That night, I woke up in a cold sweat, and I knew that I couldn't let my curiosity get the best of me, and I had to move on. So the next day, I packed up my campsite and I continued on the hike, eager to put some distance between myself and the creature. As I walked, I thought about everything I had seen, and I tried to piece together what little information I had. Eventually, I reached a ranger station, and I decided to ask the park rangers if they had ever encountered anything like the creature I had seen. They listened to my story with interest, but they couldn't, or didn't, offer me any answers. One ranger suggested that it might have been a common animal in the area, but with a rare genetic mutation like a bear. But I knew that wasn't right. The creature had been much, much too small, and thin to be a bear, and its fur was unlike anything I had ever seen on an animal before. In the end, I left Yosemite with more questions than answers. I knew that I had seen something truly extraordinary, but I also knew that I might never know the truth about the mysterious creature that had crossed my path. To this day, I continue to visit national parks and to explore the wilderness. I'm always keeping an eye out for any creatures or any signs of something hiding in the shadows. While part of me hopes that I'll see that creature again, another part of me knows that some mysteries are meant to remain unsolved. Northwestern Lower Peninsula of Michigan, Summer 2007 the first time I saw it, I was about 20 years old or so. It was a Friday night, and I was with my friends. We'd all gone camping that weekend near the Manistee River. It was the summer of 2007, and not much was really going on. We were out of school and needed something to do, so we headed out for the weekend. Telling scary stories was also something we liked to do back then. And they sure get scarier when they suddenly become real. That's what happened to me. My best friend Tom was telling a story about an old local legend about a creature that was half man, half dog. I told him he was full of it, but he swore that they roamed the area. I didn't buy it. None of us really did. But it was fun to learn the local lore. We all listened around the campfire as my best friend continued on with the description of the beast-like man. Mary was roasting a hot dog on the fire. I had one too, but I burned it listening to Tom. Mary rolled her eyes and grinned at me as Tom went on with his description of the beast. Seven feet tall, with bold yellow eyes and razor-sharp teeth. The image that came to mind was scary, but nothing prepared us for what happened next. We all heard it at the same time. Something stirring in the bushes across from the campfire. A large, dark snout then emerged from the brush. We thought maybe a camper's dog had gotten loose. People did like to come to the woods in the summer. But as it began to stick its head out and its upper body emerged, we all found ourselves staring at the very thing we had just been thinking was not real. The creature's canine-like head looked just like a husky, but the upper torso was a man, a muscular man and as it crawled out into full view, I saw it had the hind legs of a dog, complete with a long, bushy tail. The fur on its head was black with a shock of white on the front, and the tail had the same colors. None of us really knew how to react. Tom glanced around in search of other signs of life. I guess he thought it was some sort of a prank. That was my first thought, too, until I locked eyes with the creature. It was like sort of gazing at a wolf. It was beautiful, and it didn't seem deadly in the moment. There was wisdom reflecting back at me, too. Ancient and extremely wild. There's no telling how the thing would react if any of us moved. It then stepped closer towards us, and a scream pierced the air, and I looked around. My friends were all stunned into some kind of horrified silence, and I realized 
The scream had come from me. I watched as the creature sniffed at the air near the hot dogs, and it seemed like it had caught the scent of our hot dogs. The saliva was oozing out of its mouth and pooling on the ground. Mary's jaw fell open, and just then, a bright orange flame engulfed her food. Within seconds, it blackened into something inedible. Then Becky got her camera and snapped a picture. The flash startled the beast, and in the blink of an eye, it grabbed the burnt hot dog and turned and ran into the woods. I yelled at Becky for snapping the photo. I'd wanted to study it more. If these creatures were real, how many of them existed? And why hadn't we met one sooner? I feel weird admitting it, but I almost even wanted to touch it. Like if I touched it, then I could actually accept what my eyes were seeing. After that night, I devoted my entire life to learning more about these creatures and trying to find them. I've had a few sightings since then. My friends still don't want to admit it even happened. But I know the truth, even though I don't talk about it much. Only to true believers, because most people are afraid of what they don't understand. Also, I've heard of people who only think that this thing appears in Michigan. But that's just not true. I've been looking online and read about one on the outskirts of Indiana. One with the head of a German shepherd. That same year, I read about one in Wisconsin that they said had the head of a Doberman. The body sounded like it was smaller than some of the others, and that one didn't have chest hair. Maybe it was some kind of a cub. Who knows? But the one thing they all seem to have in common is the upper torso is always of a human man. Either way, I plan to continue on with my research. The world deserves to know the truth. North Cascades National Park, 2018. I had always been fascinated by the great outdoors, spending most of my weekends exploring national parks and hiking trails. So, when I heard about a lesser visited national park in the Pacific Northwest, one that was rumored to be home to an unknown creature, I knew I had to investigate. My name is Jack, and I'm a wildlife photographer with a passion for capturing rare and elusive animals on camera. I live in Washington State and had heard stories about a creature that resembled a Sasquatch living in North Cascades National Park, but I always thought it was just a myth, a local legend. However, I decided to take a chance and see if there was any truth to the rumors. I spent several days preparing for my trip out to the park. I researched the area, read up on local folklore, and I studied maps to find the most promising spots for wildlife and other sightings. I also made sure to pack all the necessary equipment for my adventure, including my camera, binoculars, and camping gear. As I arrived at the park late on a Friday night, I could feel a sense of excitement building within me. I was eager to explore the beautiful wilderness and hopefully capture photos of rare and unique animals some maybe that I had never even seen before. I started my hike early in the morning, taking the trail that led deep into the heart of the park. The first few hours of my hike were uneventful, and I was beginning to feel a little disappointed. However, as I approached a clearing, I noticed some interesting movement in the distance. At first I thought I was about to encounter a bear, but as I got closer, I realized that it was not a bear at all. It was this massive, hairy creature, standing at least eight feet tall with broad shoulders and long, muscular arms. Its face was covered in hair, and its eyes were deep-set and piercing. The creature seemed to just be as surprised as I was to come across it, and we stood there as the world seemed to stand still, as we stared at each other in silence. The creature eventually then let out a low growl, but it never broke its gaze from me, and that's when I realized that I needed to act fast. I slowly reached for my camera, hoping to capture a photo of it before anything happened, even though at the time I wasn't letting myself think of a worst-case scenario. I snapped a few pictures, and the action of it seemed to really get the creature thinking. It then squinted harder at me and began to move towards me. It was incredibly fast for its size, and I knew I had to move now if I wanted to avoid an encounter. 
I turned and I ran as fast as I could, my heart pounding between my ears. I could sense that the creature was close behind me, but I managed to make it back to my car and jump inside to safety. I locked the doors and I turned on the car without even looking back. I was even able to drive away before anything bad happened. I drove home in this weird trance-like state, almost like my brain couldn't compute what had just happened and it had shut down on me. Luckily, I did get home and then fell right to sleep. In the morning, it all seemed like a dream. I could barely believe what I remembered happening. And then I remembered my camera. And then while reviewing my photos, I slowly grew terrified as I realized the true magnitude of what had happened, what I had witnessed. The Sasquatch creature was real, and I had managed to capture proof of its existence. Now I'm just working up the courage to share what I found. It still sort of scares me. Although the encounter was scary and overwhelming, at the same time I also feel strangely like it's an experience that I cherish. Basically, it reminded me of the true magic and mystery that lies within nature, and I got to witness some of that firsthand. Now, I just need to feel completely safe before I can take any further chances with what I know. Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 2015 Late in the summer of 2015, I decided to head off and do a solo week-long camping trip in the Great Smoky Mountains of eastern Tennessee. I had always wanted to give a long camping trip a shot, to reset and recharge. I knew it would be therapeutic to just basically unplug from life. Anyway, I narrowed it down to a remote campground that my friend had told me about, one that was only a few hours' drive north of where I lived. The camping site itself was definitely remote and a bit of a hike from the parking lot, so I made sure to pack lightly so that I could carry everything I would need. I found the place pretty easily, and I was happy to see that it wasn't all that crowded. Just a few other groups and myself. I pitched my tent on top of the hill that I found at the far back corner of the camping site. As far as I knew, there were no other camping groups planning to set up around me, which would be good in helping me to get away from everything. Anyway, another reason I chose to pitch my tent on top of the hill was so that I could see the entire forest and the lake way off in the distance. Also, it seemed like a cool place to just realize the vastness of the whole area. I also thought camping on top of the hill felt safer for some reason. While I had been camping there for a few nights, all was going well. But then other camping groups started to gather, and I started to feel slightly cramped and decided it was time to move somewhere else. I found a tiny cleared-out spot down a bit, near the tree line. It was interesting down there, and being near the trees brought new and interesting experiences, like starting to recognize the sights and sounds of the animals and the forest creatures. Because I wanted to get some nature photographs, I decided to head out for a short hike on my third day in this new place. The weather was beautiful, with blue skies, so it seemed like the perfect time to go on a little adventure before sunset. As I hiked deep into the forest, I heard some rustling noises from behind me, but they weren't very loud, so I didn't think too much of them and continued walking further into the woods. And then, all of a sudden, it seemed like the air got heavy and still. The relaxing atmosphere turned to one where I felt like something was about to happen like right before a big storm or something like that. I looked all around, trying to see if anything seemed out of place, but I couldn't see anything strange. However, as soon as I turned to look behind me, that's when things got really weird. Standing behind me on the trail, looking at me squarely in the eyes, was the most disturbing creature I had ever seen. This thing was standing on two legs and towering high above me. It had fur that was all matted and tangled, making its body basically obscure, fuzzy, as though it was shrouded in this heavy mist. I realized that's a weird description. But the thing I couldn't move my gaze from was its eyes, and how they glowed yellow and they stared intently at me. 
It sort of looked like a dog or a wolf, but with a human body. Obviously, I've seen many dogs before, but this one looked different from every single dog I had ever come across. This wasn't just because of how ugly it was. There was something else about it, but I can't pinpoint exactly what that was. I wondered silently to myself, what is going on here, when I saw the shaggy creature staring at me. It almost seemed like it had come straight out of hell itself. And that's when it made its move, and it took a step towards me. At this point, it was about 30 feet behind me. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that at this point, I was incredibly nervous, and the hairs on my head started to stand on end. I wasn't even sure if I could do anything to save myself if I had to. The yellow eyes from the creature just stared at me with this expressionless look, and then it took another step closer. I was thinking that I probably should have taken a few steps back from it, but then I was worried that my movement would spark its prey instinct, and it could pounce. In the end, I just stood there. I'm glad I stood my ground. Anyway, if something like that's going to attack you, there's really not much you can do about it. I'm sure that even the most experienced fighter would have definitely thought twice about taking on this creature. I watched it then take another step forward, and against my better judgment, I turned and I ran, as hard as I could. I don't even think I made a conscious decision to do it. I just did. I ran back towards the camping area. I sped through the thick forest at a pace that would have made any Olympic sprinter jealous. While running as fast as I could, I yelled to myself, I did not come camping here to be eaten by a creature. Meanwhile, all of this probably only happened within about 20 to 30 seconds. So after pushing my body to its limit, I was finally able to make it back to my camping site. I packed everything up as fast as I could, and I headed out of there to my car. I had no idea if that thing was behind me, or if it would follow me, or what. Luckily, I got out of there without any further incident other than some of the other campers looking at me strangely. I'd run to my car with my backpack half hanging open because I had packed it and left so quickly. I'm sure I looked half crazed or maybe even totally crazed. Anyway, in my haste to pack and get out of there, I dropped and lost my camera, which I had been hoping might have caught a picture of the creature. But no such luck. After getting back home, I started doing some research on the internet to try and figure out what it could have been. A lot of the information I found about creatures basically told me that they're just a bunch of hocus-pocus. Some people even said that these kind of creatures were extinct or that they never even existed at all. I don't believe that. How could something like that not exist? It was definitely real because I saw it with my own two eyes. And I also found lots of people who do totally believe in these creatures, including this channel. When writing this article to share what happened, I decided to look for actual photographs of dogman creatures. Although I found numerous pictures of them on the internet, None of them looked exactly like the creature I encountered. There must be different types to some extent, but I'm not sure. I'm sort of hoping somebody out there might know about that stuff. But then again, I don't know exactly if what I saw was a dog man, but it certainly was something very bizarre and horrifying, which is why I decided to write this and send it to you. I'm hoping that you guys can all help me to know what happened to me out there. Thanks for your help. Mount Rainier National Park, July 2018. The summer between my junior and senior year of college, I took a road trip with a few of my best friends. We planned a route around the western United States, camping and hiking in the national parks. We were all from the East Coast, so it was an awesome trip overall, getting to spend time out west. Towards the end of July, we went up to Mount Rainier National Park. We planned to spend a week there, camping inside the park each night. We had purposely chosen a spot at the far end of the campsite, away from the other campers. We tended to occasionally get loud, so we tried not to annoy other people if we could help it. Luckily, our stop was fairly isolated from other campers. The first two days and nights went fine. We hiked different trails during the day, and then we came back to the campground, made dinner, 
and sat around the fire. We would hang out, talking, but generally turned in early enough that we could get up and hike first thing in the morning. By this point, we had a solid routine going. The third night, we all settled into our tents at around 10 or so. At some point that night, I was woken up by a horrific sound. Something like a cross between a howl and a groan. It sounded like an animal dying horribly. My friend woke up too. We sat up, stared at each other while listening again for the sound. And it came again. Two more times before it stopped. We slowly made our way out of the tent to see if our other friends had woken up. They had, too. We all grabbed our flashlights and stood around, waiting to see if anything else would happen. We all had our guesses as to what we heard. My best guess was a coyote or a fox. But the others insisted it was a bear or even a wild boar. But basically, we had absolutely no idea. It wasn't a noise any of us had heard before. Our food was packed away in a cooler in the car. We'd been doing this all summer and we weren't stupid, but we were still worried about something ransacking our tents. We had had a few close calls at other parks that summer, so we were being very careful. We waited outside our tents for maybe 20 more minutes, but didn't hear that horrible sound again. So we all gave up and went back into our tents. The next morning, after we were all dressed and ready to hit the trails, our one friend yelled for us to come over to where he was standing. He was standing in the woods about 20 feet from the campsite. When we got to him, we saw why he called us over. There were five giant footprints in the mud, leading off into the trees. Each one was about twice as long as one of our footprints, but it wasn't a shoe print. It had claw marks at the end. We took some pictures planning to stop in the park office later that day to see if they knew what it was. It seemed too large for a bear, but we had no idea what else it could be. One of the guys even half-jokingly said it was a Bigfoot. Of course, we all laughed that off, but I think we were all silently freaking out that something with that big of a foot had been so close to our tents without us even knowing. We did stop in the park office and showed a ranger the pictures, and the guy promised to look into it, but he did not seem very concerned. He did warn us about bears and reminded us to lock up food and carry bear spray if we could. It wasn't really very helpful. That night we hung out by the fire again, but we were much more subdued than in the past days. We were all half listening for that strange noise again, or anything out of the ordinary for that matter. That night I didn't sleep well. I was worried about falling dead asleep and being attacked by a giant bear. Nothing happened though, not even the sounds. Thinking that it was a fluke, we got up the next morning and got ready for day four of our time in the park. Having done the major trails already, we ended up on a smaller, less trafficked trail. Usually we saw tons of other hikers, but this one was deserted. A few hours in, we stopped for a lunch break. We had spotted a nice big rock off the trail and decided to rest on top of it while we ate our sandwiches. While we sat eating, we didn't talk a whole lot. That's why it was so obvious. We all heard the animal, or what we thought was an animal. It came ambling towards us, occasionally making sounds as it walked. We sat still, waiting for it to get closer and see what it was. It crossed my mind that it could be our campsite bear, but we were pretty far from that site, and because we were up on the rock, we had a good vantage point. When the animal came closer, we could see down right onto the top of its head. I'm not even sure if it knew we were there. We watched as it pushed through some thick evergreen trees, and we saw all eight feet of it, walking upright. We froze watching as this giant, hairy creature walked through the trees, no more than 15 feet away from us. Amazingly, it never did seem to see us up on top of the rock. We all stayed completely still and totally silent, although we exchanged looks to make sure we were all seeing it. We couldn't see its features clearly, just glimpses of mounds of dark hair, and then it disappeared. Minutes later, the noises faded too. 
We waited another ten minutes before we dared to talk, trying to figure out what we had just seen. I was ready to believe that it was somebody just messing with us, more so than an actual Bigfoot. But it definitely was not a bear. I knew that. We were too stunned to do anything right then. We hiked back to our campsite where we were going to decide what to do next. However, right away I stumbled onto a coyote, and it was absolutely ripped to shreds in the brush right behind our tents. I pointed it out to everybody, and we all agreed. We needed to leave right away. We didn't even talk. We just packed up and hightailed it out of the park that night, and we stayed at a cheap motel. We never talked about what we saw with anybody. We basically had no proof, and we figured that nobody would believe us anyway. But there was absolutely something unnatural in that park. Something we couldn't explain. And we all saw it. At least we all have each other to talk it through with, if we ever need to. Rock Island, Illinois, 2016. I will never forget the story I'm about to tell you, even if I make it to a hundred years old. It was a sunny Saturday in October of 2016. My friend Christina and I were going on a road trip from Chicago to Rock Island, Illinois to have dinner and hang out with her boyfriend who was in college there. We woke up that morning at about 10, packed snacks for the car ride and clothes for the day. In order to get there, we had to drive about three hours total. I told my mom that we would not be home until super late that night, even though we both had to work the next day. She said it was okay, but to call her when we got there, so she knew we had made it. When you're 18, you hate checking in with your mom, but I told her I would do it, and she's pretty cool anyway. Christina and I finished packing our bags and walked out to the car. We got in and I put in my new iPhone just because I had just bought it, and I was looking forward to listening to music while we were driving. We finally left at 11 o'clock, hoping that there would be no traffic and that it would only take us three hours to get there. I remember we were listening to Ariana Grande's new album Dangerous Woman during the first hour. And after that, Christina put in her earbuds and said she was going to sleep because she had stayed up late the night before. I didn't mind. I always liked to drive, and that way I could be by myself with my own thoughts. It gives me time to think about stuff and listen to whatever I want and just daydream out the window. Anyway, soon after she went to sleep, I needed to stop for gas because I had forgotten to fill up before we took off. I know. So we got off the highway and parked at a gas station. Something in the air there, in the middle of the drive, though, seemed strange. But I didn't pay too much attention to it. I called my mom and told her we were just about halfway and we were still on track to get to Rock Island before three. Soon we were back on the highway with me still driving and Christina still sleeping. This was the final leg of the trip and the highway was starting to feel monotonous. At one point I even started to see things and I would swear that I had seen a pack of wild dogs, big dogs, just into the tree line along the highway. It was pretty rural in this part of the state, which was a little unnerving to me, being that I was from the city. But I told myself that there was nothing that would really be that big just wandering along the highway. So I told myself it was just a pile of leaves or brush or something. Then about 20 minutes passed and Christina woke up. She asked what song was playing because she said she heard a dog howling in the background of the song and that it had woken her up. I said, no, you were totally dreaming, and we just got off to talking about other stuff and forgot about it. Finally, we did make it to Rock Island and spent a fun afternoon and early evening with her boyfriend. He tried to convince us to stay, but we both needed to get back home, and so we stayed as long as we felt comfortable, knowing that we had to drive back in the dark. Before we left, Christina's boyfriend told us to just call him when we got on the highway, and then again when we got home. Soon into the return drive, it seemed to me that it was extra dark outside, like there was no moonlight at all, and I could barely see the road. With all of this darkness, I wondered if it was a new moon, and I started to get a bit scared because it looked so creepy out there on the highway, with just the car and the truck lights whizzing past. But eventually, watching the lights rush past us started to become mesmerizing. 
and actually started to soothe me. And I started to relax. But then about halfway home, I noticed a set of lights off ahead. Lights that looked to be on the side of the road, and they didn't seem to be moving. I squinted at them to get a better view, and I realized that the lights were not from another car. At least they weren't moving. They were just static, staying in the same place. There were no other cars on the highway at this point, so I slowed down a bit, and I turned on my high beams to better see what I thought I was seeing. And that is the moment that changed my life forever. What I saw can only be described as the most horrifying creature alive. The thing was easily over seven feet tall and had human arms and dog legs and paws. And the thing's body was completely covered in hair, eyes blacker than the night sky, but then somehow reflecting light brighter than could ever be normal. I mean, it was light they were creating, their own light, and casting it right at me. And when the thing saw me looking straight at it, I could see that the dog face morphed into a face that was contorted in rage. I totally lost control of the car, and I swerved all over the road. And I eventually landed off the side, where I came to a stop. Luckily, there were no trees or barriers around, because if my car had hit any of them, or anything else for that matter, we would probably have been dead. I don't remember exactly what happened next, but my next memory is of the creature standing squarely in front of our car, on its two hind legs, and howling up to the sky. It must have run up to where we stopped, and all I could hope was that it didn't rip the doors open or smash our windows. I reached over and I shook Christina, who was unbelievably just coming too, despite all that had just happened. She quickly snapped too when she heard the dog noises, though and then froze when her eyes locked onto what was outside our front window. By this time, I was screaming hysterically, which seemed to interrupt the creature, because it stopped the howling and it stared straight back at me. And then I watched it slowly raise an arm and point directly at me while snarling and twitching its mouth and its lips. Christina was now screaming too as we both watched it rush at our car and jump onto the hood, crashing at the metal with a noise that you would not believe. The thing then proceeded to walk from one end to the other on top of the car, stomping on the metal and hissing and snarling at us from above. I was still screaming, and we both thought we were going to die in those minutes, but inexplicably the dog thing then jumped off our hood and ran away into the night. We sat in that spot for at least 30 minutes. Well, it might have really been only five or so, but we were hyperventilating and trying to calm ourselves when the phone rang. It was Christina's boyfriend, asking if we were home. She stumbled over her words, blurting out to him the entire story, saying that we had run into a dog man, and we were now sitting on the side of the road, and we were both traumatized, and we couldn't move. He was quiet for a moment, and then he asked what the thing looked like to which Christina completely described everything we saw and everything it did. He then said that he totally believed us, and told us that those things are real creatures that have been sighted all over the world for hundreds of years. told him to stay on the phone with us while I tried to get the car started and out of the grassy patch that we were in. I knew I needed to get my wits about me enough to leave the area to just keep us both alive. I managed to put my car into drive, and I gunned it. I remember dog fur flying everywhere, which must have come off the creature as it stomped and smashed the car. Christina's boyfriend told us to head straight home, obviously, and not stop for anyone or anything, obviously. We listened. We arrived home just before midnight, and my mom was waiting up for us. As soon as she saw the car, she became hysterical and asked what in the hell had happened. There was no way I thought she would believe us if I told her the truth. I also didn't want to worry her, and I was worried she would think we had been drinking or something, so I told her we just hit a deer. I was also imagining trying to explain a dogman sighting to the police or an insurance agent, and I definitely did not want to deal with that. So here we are, two traumatized attack victims who will never be the same again. We were lucky enough to have survived our encounter with one of these creatures. And if you don't believe me after hearing this, then I truly feel sorry for you. Those things are no joke. 
and you're crazy if you believe they aren't real or that they're not out there. Oh yeah, and by the way, I told Christina I was never able to drive her back to Rock Island again. Southern Illinois, 2013. My one and only creature encounter happened in Southern Illinois, and that's what I'm here to tell you about. I was visiting my friend Steve, who lives near the Shawnee National Forest. It was the middle of the night one night, around two or three in the morning, and I woke up because his dog had started barking like crazy and pacing back and forth between the bedroom window facing the woods and the door. I woke up grumpily and asked Steve what was going on and did the dog normally do this? He said his dog never barks, so he got right up and went over to check things out. As soon as Steve got up, his dog went running to the back door in the kitchen, really wanting to get outside. So Steve naturally let him out, I'm sure at that point just thinking that he had to go to the bathroom or something. But just a few minutes later, the dog came running back inside the house. I later learned the dog had its tail between its legs, and it looked very scared. The dog was whimpering and just sat on the floor, panting really hard. I could hear Steve talking to the dog, trying to calm him down. Of course, this all made me get out of bed to see what was going on. When I got to the kitchen, the back door was still open, and all of a sudden, we heard this really loud, howling cry that was probably four or five times louder than anything a normal animal or even a human could make. It sounded like a cross between a dog and a baby crying. It was weird. His dog now started shaking even more, and I was worried he was going to have a heart attack or something. I mean, the dog couldn't even stand up. And that's when Steve told me that he had stood outside while the dog was out there, and he thought he saw something, something big and black, back beyond the tree line, and that it had just stood there without moving for as long as Steve watched it. He said he thought it looked furry, but he couldn't really tell in the darkness. He said his dog had run over to that area where the figure was, but then had come running back almost as quickly as he had gone over. As we sat there, a few more seconds passed before this strange howling noise started again. And then a few seconds later, the strange howling noise seemed to stop. And then we heard this rustling, loud rustling of leaves and twigs breaking, as if somebody was moving big pieces of brush around. We decided that we better go figure out what was out there. I mean, at this point, we were just rationalizing that it's somebody breaking into the yard. And so we went outside with a few flashlights to investigate. I said, why don't we just go into the woods a bit? Like, go after it to see what it is. Like I said, at this point, we were all just thinking that maybe it was a person trying to break in or something like that. Steve said, no way. It was definitely a creature of some sort by the way his dog was reacting. He was certain. We both looked around half-heartedly for a bit after that, but eventually went back inside and locked all the doors but neither of us could go back to sleep because we were both pretty freaked out about it all. I've been calling it an encounter because what I figured out from looking around on the computer the next day was that there have been sightings of an inexplainable dog-like creature in southern Illinois. The article I found described a creature just like what Steve thinks he saw, large and sort of human-like, but also dog-like and furry. It even described a scream that was just like what we heard. I realized after reading all of that that Steve really did see something super weird. Something out of the ordinary. Something probably cryptid. Just wondering if anybody else out there has had sightings like this? I'd love to hear them. Please let me know. Denver, Colorado, 2018 I was out camping with my buddies in the mountains outside of Denver. We were having a great time, sitting around the campfire, roasting marshmallows, and telling scary stories. Little did we know, we were about to experience something straight out of a horror movie. It was getting late one night, and most of us decided to turn in for the night. But my friend Jake and I decided to stay up a bit longer and enjoy the peacefulness of the forest. 
We were sitting on some logs, chatting away, when suddenly we heard a rustling nearby. At first we thought it might be a small animal, so we grabbed our flashlights and went to investigate. As we approached the source of the noise, we started to feel a strange vibration on the air. The air felt heavy and an eerie silence fell upon the woods. And then out of nowhere, we saw it. It suddenly emerged from the shadows, this massive figure towering over us and getting taller with each step it took closer to us. Eventually, it was standing about eight feet tall on two legs and it had a muscular body covered in fur that glistened under the moonlight. Its long pointed ears twitched as it turned its head towards us, revealing a face that sent chills down our spines. The creature had a snout that resembled a wolf with sharp fangs protruding from its mouth. Its glowing eyes pierced through the darkness, reflecting an intelligence that was unsettling to say the least. Its powerful, muscular frame exuded strength and agility, and as it took a step closer, we could see its clawed hands flexing. Fear gripped us, paralyzing our bodies. The creature emitted a low, guttural growl that resonated deep within our chests. It was a sound that seemed to vibrate through the very core of the forest, sending a wave of primal terror through our veins. Realizing that we were in imminent danger, Jake elbowed me to snap us out of our trances, and we then instinctively turned to run. But the creature was fast. It lunged towards us with incredible speed, and its powerful strides were closing the distance between us. Adrenaline fueled our escape as we sprinted back to the campsite, shouting incoherently for the others to wake up. Confusion and panic spread among our friends as they stumbled out of their tents trying to grasp what was going on. I looked back and unbelievably did not see the creature, but there's no way I didn't believe it was still out there. I knew 100% that it wanted us gone. I knew that it was watching us. Our friends saw the fear etched on our faces and the desperation in our voices and without hesitation, they scrambled to pack up our belongings, no questions asked. As we hurriedly packed our tents and our gear, I could feel the creature's presence lingering in the shadows. It seemed to taunt us, and I was sure that I could see yellow eyes flickering from behind the dense foliage. Every rustle, every snapped twig sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the forest itself had come alive with malevolence. Finally, we jumped into our cars and sped away from what I now call that cursed place, our tires kicking up dust from the dirt road. The relief we felt upon leaving that nightmarish scene was palpable, but the memory of the creature's haunting presence remained etched in our minds. Finally, in the safety of our homes, we shared the entire details of our encounter with our friends, hoping to find some answers or validation from them. Some dismissed our stories just a figment of our imagination, or a prank gone too far. But those who saw the terror in our eyes, the genuine trauma we carried, they knew there was something more to it. To this day, Jake and I can't explain what we witnessed. We've heard stories of similar creatures, cryptids that blend the characteristics of wolves and humans but nothing can truly come close to what we feel having seen one for ourselves. Lake Michigan, July 2014. Two years ago, I moved to Lansing, Michigan for work. Things were going well at the new job, and I was confident that I would be at the company for a while. So I bought a small lake house on the upper edge of Lake Michigan. It was a small, basic cabin, but it was good enough for weekends away and a few weeks of the summer. I bought the cabin in the fall, but I only got to spend a few weekends there before winter. I had two huskies, and they quickly loved the cabin, too. Or more specifically, the beach. The next spring, I went out and I did some repairs, but only spent four or five days there at the most. My first extended stay was going to be in July when I took two full weeks of vacation. I spent the first days walking the dogs along the shore, canoeing and just hanging out. 
A few times I walked the dogs through the wooded area behind the cabin, but I didn't do it much because almost every time I did, the dogs caught the scent of something that caused them to go berserk. They were normally chill dogs, but they would start barking and pulling on their leashes like crazy. I would have to drag them out of the area, and even then, they weren't calm again until we got back to the cabin. I assumed it was something stupid like raccoons because a few mornings I had found the garbage cans knocked over. And then one night, I was woken up in the middle of the night by the dogs. They were barking, maniacally, trying to break down the back door, it seemed. I turned on the light to look outside, but I didn't see anything. I got the dogs locked in the bedroom and they eventually settled down. But just as I was getting ready to go back to bed, I heard it again. It was some kind of howling. That must have been what set the dogs off this time. Having huskies, I was more than familiar with dogs' howls. And that's not what this was. It also didn't sound like coyotes or anything else I could recognize. I made sure all the doors and the windows were locked tight, and then I went back to bed, glad to have the dogs as a warning system. The next day, I stopped in the general store to pick up some supplies. The cashier was an older man, friendly and chatty, so I asked him about the howls that I had heard the night before. I asked if he knew of any wolves in the area, or anything similar. When I did, he gave me a very strange look, and he finally told me that there was some kind of animal in the woods, one that no one had ever seen, but folks would occasionally call animal control after hearing the sounds or else they would have trouble with property damage. He specifically told me to always keep my dogs on their leashes, because in a few rare instances, pets had gone missing too. I went back to the cabin more than a little concerned. I had bought that cabin as a refuge, a place to get away from work stress in the city. The last thing I wanted was to be worrying about some wild animal attacking me or the dogs. I knew one of my co-workers had grown up in the area. I gave him a call that day, too, to see if he knew anything. When I told him what the old man said, he just laughed. It had been some kind of a folk tale that he had heard as a kid, but it wasn't real, he said. Apparently, it was just the locals' version of a Bigfoot, some kind of a werewolf-type creature. However, he did suggest that I do what the guy said and keep an eye on the dogs. But otherwise, he said, don't worry about it. So feeling a little better, I let it go. The rest of the week passed without any issues, but the night before I was to leave, the dogs woke me up. Once again, they were barking and scratching at the door. Nervously, I turned on the light and I looked outside. I had put a canoe oar inside by the door the other day, just in case. I picked it up and I stepped outside. I didn't go out more than a few steps. I wasn't that crazy but I wanted to see if there was anything out there. As I got outside the cabin, I could hear a new sound. Not the howling, but a panting sound. It sounded like a dog, so I rationalized that there was just a stray dog in the woods. It would explain the scavenging and the way that my dogs reacted. So I stood near the back door waiting and watching. At this point, I just wanted to know what I was dealing with. And then all of a sudden, the dogs flipped out again, barking and yipping from the bedroom, out the window. I jumped and turned and yelled at them, but then I saw something coming around the side of the cabin. But it was outside the circle of light, so I could only see a tall shadow. I held the oar up as a sad weapon, and I stared into the darkness. The figure crept closer until I could see it more clearly. My first thought was werewolf. It was ridiculous, but it was the best description I had. The thing had a canine head, but it was walking upright. It was covered in masses of dark fur, but I could see a skinny body underneath. Less dog and more human. It had huge claws, and when it opened its mouth to howl, I could see massive teeth. Without thinking, I chucked the oar at it, and I dove back inside. I got inside and slammed the door shut, locked it, and pushed the small kitchen table in front of it. And then I ran back to the bedroom and I closed and locked that door too. I huddled in that room with the dogs until dawn. I occasionally heard some sounds around the cabin, but the thing didn't try to come in. In the morning, I packed everything up, 
ran for the car, and got the hell out of there. The next week, I put the cabin back on the market, and I have never been back since. As a park ranger at Yosemite National Park, I've always had a deep love and respect for the natural world. There's something about the majestic mountains, cascading waterfalls, and diverse array of wildlife that I just love. But lately, I've had a feeling that something is off here. It's hard to explain, but it's like a nagging feeling in the back of my mind that something is not right. I've tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but the feeling persists. I was on my usual rounds one day, checking on the various hiking trails and making sure everything was in order. As I was walking through the dense forest, I heard a strange noise. It sounded like a cross between a growl and a snarl, and it seemed to be coming from just ahead of me on the trail. I cautiously approached, my hand hovering over my radio, prepared to call for backup. As I peered through the trees, I saw something I could not explain. It was a creature that was unlike anything I'd ever seen in the park, let alone anywhere. It was covered in thick, shaggy fur and had a lupine head and glowing red eyes. Its body was muscular and powerful, and it stood on two legs like a human. But there was something off about it, something almost otherworldly. I froze, unsure of what to do. I'd heard of strange sightings in the park before, but I had always assumed that they were just hoaxes or the result of people seeing things in the shadows. But this was different. This creature was real, and it was right in front of me. I slowly backed away, trying to keep my movements slow and steady so as not to startle the creature. But as I turned to run, it let out a deafening roar, and it lunged at me. I sprinted back down the trail, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew I had to get to safety and alert the other rangers. I radioed for backup and headed back to the visitor center as quickly as I could. When I arrived, I was panting and out of breath, but I managed to get out a garbled explanation of what I had seen. The other rangers looked at me with skepticism, but I could see the fear in their eyes. They knew that if what I was saying was true, it could be a major problem for the park. We decided to send out a team to investigate and see if we could find any trace of the creature. I volunteered to go despite my own fear. I had to know what this thing was and how it had come to be in the park. We searched the area intensely where I'd seen the creature, but we found no sign of it. We searched for hours, but it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And then as the sun began to set, we called off the search and headed back to the visitor center. I was exhausted and disheartened, but I knew we couldn't give up. We had to find out what this thing was and stop it from affecting the park. Over the next few days, we searched intently. I know it's impossible, but it sure felt like we searched almost every inch of the area where I was. But we still didn't find any trace. It was like it never even existed. But I knew what I had seen. I knew that it was real, and I couldn't shake the feeling. So then as the weeks went by, the feeling only grew stronger. And then one night, I heard the same growl that I had heard before, but this time, it was coming from outside my cabin, and it was louder and more menacing than ever. I knew that I had to act fast. I grabbed my flashlight and my radio, and I stepped outside, ready to face whatever was out there. And that's when I saw it again. The creature was back, and it was even more terrifying to me than before. It was too close now too close for comfort. Its eyes glowed red in the darkness and its fur bristled as it let out its deafening roar. But this time I was prepared. I shone my flashlight directly into its eyes, hoping to blind it temporarily. And as it stumbled backwards, I grabbed my radio and I called for backup. Within minutes, the other rangers arrived and we were able to surround the creature with the intentions of capturing it and securing both it and the park. However, it put up a fierce fight, one that took over an hour of intense teamwork on our end. And in the end, we were unfortunately unable to contain it. The creature overpowered us and took off back into the wilderness. All we could do was watch as it headed away. The safety of the park is still a concern, though. 
We did inform our supervisors, and they assured us that they would take the proper steps to ensure the park was not a danger. However, since that day, I've heard no further updates. And when I ask, I'm just told that things are being taken care of. I'm not sure what will happen going forward, but I'm happy to know that it was my intuition telling me that something was wrong in the park, and it was up to me, as a park ranger, to do something about it. To be honest, that's what keeps me going. Minnesota, 2010 Midway through the year of 2010, I began hanging out again with my high school friend, Ian. We had dated in the past, and we were now just friends, but I kept thinking it might turn into more again, so I was really putting in the time to see him as much as possible. I was living in Minneapolis at the time, and I was making weekend trips over to visit him every few weeks or so in St. Cloud, nearly always ending up spending most of the day on Sunday hanging out until the last minute, and then I'd be driving home late at night. After one such weekend getaway, it had started raining while I was driving back, and the roads were glistening from the rain, and visibility was tough. My eyes were definitely tired and glassy when I finally got off my exit, and I kept having to blink them to focus the last few miles. Finally, I pulled up to my apartment complex just after 11, and I parked in my parking spot next to the wall that butts up against the highway. I turned my car off, grabbed my black and gray striped umbrella, and headed towards my apartment and the sidewalk to my front door, pulling my small wheeled suitcase in tow. About halfway to the door, I realized that I might have forgotten my wallet on the seat of the car, since I had to take it out to pay tolls. I turned around and took a few steps back towards the car, frustrated that I had to do it in the rain. I was also thinking about how late it was, and how cold it still was, when suddenly something ran out in front of me, across my path, and blocked me. I stopped in my tracks. I didn't know what it was at first and I was petrified as I stood there listening to its heavy breathing and moans. The rain was coming down harder now, and I was blinking through it, trying to focus on what this thing was. It was also standing right between me and a street light, which backlit the thing, making it hard to see more than just its silhouette. What I do know is that standing in front of me was the most insane thing I have ever seen. It was between seven and nine feet tall, just massive, with dark fur all over its body. And it had two arms like an ape. And when it stood up, the best way I can describe its face is that it looked like a cross between a monkey and a human, with deep-set eyes and very long fingers. The outline of its body was similar to the shape of a human, and it stood there on two back legs that seemed bent in this crazy position with its hands hanging to its sides, nonchalantly, blocking the path back to my car, sniffing around in the air, too. It was so strange because I don't even know if it knew I was there by the way it just kept swinging its head around and sniffing, and it didn't care one bit that it was getting soaked. It didn't look uncomfortable at all. I stood there wide-eyed as this thing seemed to not have a care in the world, but somehow wanted to block me, toy with me. And after a very short time, it let out a deep growl and slowly brought its arms up to the front of its chest, looked me right in the eyes, and then let out this long, bone-chilling screech. And that snapped me back to reality. I screamed back at it. I have no idea why I did this, but I dropped my suitcase and I started waving my arms wildly at it. I think I reacted as if it was a bear, which is something most people from Minnesota know how to do if they encounter one. It's almost like my brain calculated that this huge beast was a bear and instinctively made me act as if it was. And then I started shouting. I don't even remember what I shouted at it, but I do recall yelling something like, back up, go away, over and over. I wasn't sure if it could understand words, but as soon as those came out of my mouth, both of its arms dropped to its side, and it turned quickly, as if someone had said a magic word, but a magic word that sent it into a fit of rage, as its face contorted and twisted, 
After more screaming and hissing on its part, it galloped off into the darkness between two buildings across from me, making this god-awful sound like nothing I've ever heard before. All I can say is that we don't have anything here in Minnesota that even remotely is similar to this sound, and I can't really describe it as other than saying it made every hair on my body stand straight, and it made me feel sick to my stomach. I've never had a feeling like that before, and I don't think I will ever forget it as long as I live. As soon as it was gone, the chills went up and down my spine, and not knowing if it would come back at any second, I bolted towards my apartment building. I ran as fast as I could. I reached the door, and then I turned, and I looked, watching the space where it had run off, and I slammed the door behind me. I made it inside, and I locked all three deadbolts before my knees buckled and I collapsed on the floor. And then the sobs came out of me for what felt like an hour straight. After a bunch of crying, I told myself to get it together, and I headed over to the computer to try to figure out what had just happened, what I had seen. It was late, but there was no way I would be able to fall asleep. My body was still pumping adrenaline like crazy. I sat down at the computer and I typed the words, Hairy Animal. That stands on back legs, and up popped immediately the word dogman and a detailed description. The dogman is an upright, walking, short haired, muscular creature that stands on its back legs, sometimes with the palms of its hands facing forward. It has a dog or wolf like head and long canine teeth, which are larger than a normal human being's. They've been known to kill both animals and humans for no apparent reason, although it's highly unlikely. They walk very fluidly on their back legs with good speed, and a horrible smell may accompany it. I just sat there, staring at the screen in shock. I feel it was a miracle that it never touched me or hurt me, and that it just headed off after scaring the crap out of me. Ian and I talked about it, and he told me to keep it to myself. He didn't want anyone thinking I was crazy. I'm so glad he believes me, though. And if you were there, you would certainly think so, too. There's just no way to deny it. But to be clear, there's nothing positive about the encounter. And it's still very real and raw to me, even though it's been over 12 years. It was a scary night for sure, and I would love to tell you that I haven't gone outside after dark since then, but that's totally impossible. What I can tell you, though, is that I now always carry a can of mace, and I've never again forgotten to check for my wallet before getting out of my car. Newark, New Jersey, September 2019. I had been working at PATH, the Port Authority Trans-Hudson Rail System, for about four years at that point. The network is further out than the central lines of the New York subway, which I had also worked on a few years earlier, but this line was no less full of problems. It seemed like every day my engineer buddies and I would be called out to fix some fault or adjust some rail that was malfunctioning. It wasn't exactly the greatest job, but it paid well, and if you had the right crew with you, it could be a decent gig, and you could enjoy some laughing as you worked. That wasn't to say that sometimes it wasn't creepy, especially if you're working sections on your own. Sometimes it did feel really weird down there. You would step off the platform where everything was nicely lit, and the people were just standing around waiting for the next train, and then you would step into and hit this sort of barrier. Most times I didn't think about it. I would just bang on my headlamp and stroll merrily into the tunnel. But recently, close to the time that I saw what I saw, I had become a lot more nervous about it, a lot more aware. It didn't help that a few weeks earlier I had read an article about the dogs in the Russian subways. A few genetics guys had shown how, over time, breeding dogs for their friendliness to man resulted in other side effects, where those same dogs passed on traits of being cuter, more juvenile-looking, and having shorter muzzles. They also proved that the opposite was happening in the subways. Dogs in the tunnels that were living as scavengers had stopped showing traits that separated them from wolves. 
Their snouts were getting longer, and they were becoming more muscular and aggressive and far less trusting of man. Packs of these feral creatures were apparently roaming parts of the Russian subway system, and I guessed it wouldn't be long until they were stalking around over here. Many of my co-workers had reported hearing growls and scratching noises in the tunnels. One had even seen a shadow of a dog moving along one of the inside walls. We took it so seriously that there were notices about it in the break room. Any sightings of dogs in the tunnels was to be reported. You'd better believe I reported mine. I was going to work on a signal switch that had been failing. It was a one-man job, and even though we were supposed to go out in pairs, I gave Cameron an early lunch break so that he could catch the game. I told him I could handle the job myself. No sooner had I crossed that threshold out of the light and into the dark of the tunnel than I knew it was a mistake, and I wished that he was there with me. There was a sound in there, some kind of a low rumbling that sounded like an animal or something up towards the other end of the tunnel. I looked back over my shoulder to the light that I had left behind me. And now I was a good 200 feet into the tunnel and the light looked like a little disc far away in the distance. The further I got from that disc, the less safe I felt and the louder the sound became. Now it's difficult in those echoey tunnels to judge exactly where a sound is coming from. But after a few more steps, when the noise, definitely a growl, seemed to get louder, I decided that the signal outage could wait. I turned and I started heading back toward the light, toward the disc that marked the opening of the tunnel, and for me, safety. And that's when I heard the growling, clear and unaltered by the echo, directly to my left. Slowly I turned toward the sound, and I saw what made it. In the time since this happened, I've had numerous people tell me it was just a dog that because I had only seen it by the light of my headlamp for a few seconds before I panicked and ran, they said I'd only seen a flash and that my mind was terrified and filled in the blanks. But that's not true. I know what I saw, and it wasn't a dog. If anything, it looked like some kind of a cross between a dog and a man. From my lamp, I just caught a glimpse of its snout and the teeth hanging under those horrible yellow eyes. The points of the pupils were tiny, and they almost disappeared because of the brightness of my light. It's hard to explain, but even though it was an animal, or it looked like an animal, the way the skin and the fleshy parts around the eyes that weren't covered in hair folded and wrinkled in on themselves, that was human, like a human face. There was expression in its eyes, too, and the creases around them. You could read the expression and the emotion that it was showing. At the moment that I flashed my light onto the thing, the expression was rage. The thing then moved towards me, and there was a flash of shaggy gray fur. Judging by where the face was positioned and how far below the ground would have been, this thing must have been standing well over seven feet tall. That is no dog. I screamed and I hurtled toward the other end of the tunnel, never looking back once and hoping, praying, that whatever it was hadn't chased me. In my report to the company, I did not write about a dog sighting. I said as clear as day that I had seen a dog man. I handed in my report at the same time that I handed in my notice. My co-workers say that there has been no further message of any of it. And needless to say, I've never been back in those tunnels. And... I no longer ride the subway. I recently found a shocking secret about our government, and I've been wrestling with what to do with that information. At first, I decided to keep quiet because I don't want to be on their radar, but it's been weighing on my conscience. I think everybody needs to hear this. My father was career military, and he was hardly ever home when I was growing up. As a result of this, I never really felt close to him. When he was home, he always had this stern look about him, and he would shut himself away in his study most of the day. Mom always told me not to bother him, saying he was trying to rest. So I grew up with my dad remaining kind of a mystery to me. I'm in my 50s now, and my mom has been gone for five years. Cancer. 
Since Dad was all I had left, I tried to find some common ground in recent years. But things were always awkward between us. He didn't rebuff me, but he was so quiet when I came to visit, I would always wind up leaving sooner than I had planned, feeling like I was crowding him. Things went downhill with his health eight and a half months ago. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he didn't have much time left. I made more of an effort to be there, and he even opened up a little, telling me some stuff about his childhood that I never knew. Nothing important, but it was nice to have him talk to me like a normal dad, reminiscing about his past. I'm thankful that we finally bonded a little before he passed, 42 days ago. When Dad made the decision to spend his final days at home, I took a leave of absence from work so I could be there with him at the end. He was on morphine and in and out of consciousness for three days. When he was lucid, he seemed really sharp. His eyes focused and his words seemed to be chosen carefully. What I mean to say is the things he decided to tell me during this period were not ramblings of a man on drugs. He told me that there were things he had done in his life that he needed to get off his chest, things he wanted me to know before it was too late. My dad told me that he had been part of a secret government branch known as the 4E. The mission of this branch was to evaluate threats to U.S. citizens from unknown entities, eradicate those threats, and employ any means necessary to erase the incidents. So for 4E, entity, evaluate, eradicate, erase. He said if the citizens of this country knew what was living here among us, there would be mass anarchy, rebellion against the government, chaos, stock markets would crash, crime would surge, people's faith in God would take a toll. I disagree with that, by the way. But my dad said during his whole lifetime he stood by that philosophy, doing things to protect our country and our way of life. So here are some of the things that he said happened. There's an underground base in Colorado that has several alien beings who were taken alive from a UFO crash in 1986. The government is trying to find a way to communicate with them. They're also testing their resistance to diseases that are a global concern. Dad said that he had seen one of the aliens himself. He said it was kept drugged and locked in a lab. He described it as looking just like you see in those pictures. Grayish, short, skinny arms and legs, oval head, big eyes. He told me that they had to keep the creatures dosed up on something because they have mental abilities to manipulate solid structures. But he didn't elaborate on that. Dad also said the government is aware of the creatures that are hiding in the national forest, like Bigfoot and Wendigo. He told me it's assumed that they have been there since the beginning of time. And although over 6,000 had been eradicated between 1948 and 1999, the population is still thought to be pretty high, like upwards of 10,000, which is staggering to me. He said he had been called in several times to strong-arm park rangers who indicated that they wanted to make the public aware of these creatures. He personally had to threaten several park rangers with losing their jobs, and also had to imply that they would be prosecuted for treason if they went ahead and told. I think Dad felt bad about that part, because he went on about it for a bit. Threatening the rangers, that is. The last thing he told me was that there was a creature that had escaped from a government lab in the 60s, and adapted to life in the swamps and the sewers. He described it to me, and it sounded like one of those rake things that people talk about. Humanoid, very pale, skittering around on all fours, big head, big black eyes, and no nose, moving very fast. He said that one of the main concerns of the rake was that it preyed on human flesh. Apparently one had killed and partially eaten one of the doctors studying it when it escaped so the population breeding in the wild was thought to be very real and a threat to mankind. I was totally shocked to hear all of this, but I tell you, looking straight into his eyes, I knew he was telling me the truth. He was totally lucid. 
Dad was afraid to say anything until he was on his deathbed, but he was so worried about these creatures as threats to human life. He didn't want me anywhere near the wilderness of this country, telling me it's unsafe. He said that there are thousands of disappearances in the national parks that are hushed up when the 4E comes in and deems one of the creatures responsible. If a body is found and the story leaks before they can cover it up, they say it was a bear or a mountain lion. But if it's just a disappearance and they think it was one of the creatures, they cover it up and the story never gets publicized. So I hope I'm doing the right thing. I know my dad wrestled with the right and wrong of telling, but lately, all I can think is, the truth is always the right way to go. May he rest in peace. Cedar Rapids, Iowa, July 2022. I used to be a canvasser for a consumer protection organization. For those who don't know what that means, a canvasser is somebody who walks around town, going door to door, knocking on strangers' doors with a clipboard to ask for donations or spread awareness for a specific cause. The cause we were all working on was pipelines and the governor's lack of commitment to limit pipelines and new oil and gas infrastructure in the state. As you might imagine, it's a tough job, both physically because we walked about 10 miles a day and emotionally because the most common response was a door shut in your face. Also, I've been threatened with a gun. I've been hit on by a clearly naked person, and I've had the cops called on me more than my fair share. But honestly, I kind of get it. We are interrupting these people at home without their permission, as late as 8.30 at night. We are strangers, and I specifically am a rather large, bearded man. I wouldn't harm a fly, and I consider myself rather jovial and carefree. But random people don't know that when they see me walking up to their house. So again, I get some of their more extreme reactions to a certain extent. One night, though, and I'll never forget this, I got the crap scared out of me. I knocked on a door and nobody answered. Next house. I knocked on the door and chatted with a nice guy for a few minutes. And although this didn't result in any donations or anybody signing up to become a member of the organization, I always appreciated nice small talk chats to break up the monotony of perpetual rejection. Finally, I came up to one of the last houses on my route. It looked like it used to be a grandiose, almost Gadsby-esque house, but it had fallen into disrepair. I knocked on the door, and in an instant it swung open. This woman with large, glassy black eyes and a full face of wrinkles wearing a white nightgown with messy white hair was staring right at me. She stared at me so intensely that it felt like her eyes could cut right through me and leave a hole in the sidewalk behind me. Her eyes were lifeless. I gulped audibly. I didn't even know until that moment that that was a real thing people do when they're scared. But I gulped. I managed to open my mouth and just barely squeak out, Hi, ma'am, when the door swung shut in front of me so hard I thought it might break. While this might sound like a normal encounter on paper, there was something so intense, so unnerving about that woman's empty stare that it set me on edge the rest of the night. Honestly, I would have never told my boss this. I just filled out the rest of my sheet saying that everybody else was not home so that I wouldn't have to keep working. I took out my phone to watch YouTube or maybe text my friends, anything to take my mind off that woman, but I had no signal, so I just decided to walk around a bit. As I walked along the empty streets, I realized that there is something creepy about the suburbs when you're the only one on the street and all the house lights are off. When it's quiet and still like that, you realize you feel exposed, and then every horror movie you've ever seen comes back to you and you imagine that Freddy Krueger's right behind you, poised to attack. I kept walking down those empty streets, looking for any sign of life so that I could feel better. I knew my boss wasn't picking me up with the van for another 20 minutes, and trust me when I tell you, I knew that was going to be the longest 20 minutes of my life. I turned a corner, and I saw some houses with their lights on. I decided to head that way. 
Like I said, I was done working for the night, and that lady definitely shook me too much to have any motivation left for knocking on doors. But just knowing that there were other people awake calmed my nerves. It's not real protection, but it's a psychological ease of the mind kind of thing. So I was walking towards those houses and already starting to feel a little better when I heard a ruffling in the trees next to me. My heart dropped. I decided to pick up the pace, and to my horror, the ruffling followed me and picked up its pace, too. I considered running, but the rational side of my brain took over, and I realized that whatever this was was probably an animal. And if it was an animal, it could probably outrun me. So my best bet was to just make myself big and make loud noises to scare it off. I have no idea if this works for every predator animal or not, but it's what I went with. So I got up as big as I could, splayed out my arms with my clipboard in my hand, and I yelled towards the trees. To my shock, an absolute terror, the creature in the woods raised itself up too and made itself bigger. And that's when I got my good first look at it. The first thing I noticed was the paws. They were huge. And my first thought was that I royally messed up. And this was a bear. But then I saw the fur gray fur. Well, I didn't know of any gray bears, so I started to calm down, thinking maybe this was a big dog or something. And then the thing raised its head above the small brush. And that's when I realized it was a wolf. Well, not a wolf. It had a wolf's head, but it also had what I can unmistakably say was a man's body. At first I thought maybe this was some sicko wearing a mask, like in the movie Saw. But then it opened its mouth, and I saw the saliva dripping out of its mouth and the deep shine in its eyes. I knew then that it was not a mask. This was somehow a creature with the body of a human and the features of a wolf. I was too scared to move. The wolf-man creature took one step towards me, and my first instinct was to hurl my clipboard at it. I will never, till the day I die, Stop being grateful that my clipboard made contact and hit the creature in the face. It then let out a loud grumble and darted back into the woods, leaving what looked like human footprints behind. I left the clipboard there. I hadn't gotten any donations that day anyway, and I sprinted as fast as my unfit legs would bring me, up near the houses with the lights. Luckily, I had a good signal there, so I called my boss and told him to pick me up early. I think he heard the urgency in my voice, because within five minutes, he was there. I never did tell him exactly what I saw. He never asked. But he knew something was up in my body language, and the look on my face. I think he knew it was best just not to ask. Anyway, I quit my job a week later. Tucson, Arizona, February 11th, 2021 I think there's something wrong with my husband. I came home one night after collecting firewood, pretty happy with how I saw the night planning out. I had a bottle of whiskey and some firewood and a great playlist in mind. Those are my favorite nights with my husband when we just sit by the fire, sipping whiskey and talking about life. It can be so easy to forget in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, but a marriage is like any other relationship. Sometimes you just take a night out of your schedule and just be kids again. But when I got home, I realized something was off about him. He's been tired a lot recently since he got promoted at work. But even so, this was like next level. He barely said a word the entire night, and he just looked inquisitively at me and at our house. It was honestly kind of heartbreaking. I know dementia doesn't run in the family, and besides... We're only in our 40s. He literally said maybe two words the entire night. He just ate dinner, drank his whiskey like it was water, and went to bed. I was determined to find out what was wrong. This was my husband, and this was very out of the ordinary. So I called a doctor, and I made an appointment after it continued for a while. Even though dementia doesn't run in the family, I knew it was a good idea to get checked. And I thought maybe the doctors could help shed light on the situation. Well, the next morning, he was relatively normal again. Gave me a kiss as soon as he came down, was super talkative at breakfast, joked around. Everything was back to normal. Let me tell you, that was a relief. 
I asked him if he was feeling well the night before, and he seemed kind of confused. Said he didn't really remember the prior few weeks. I told him he had been distant and quiet, and he said he didn't know we had hung out even just the night before. I nearly started crying right then. Then a few days later, we went to the doctor. They did all the tests, the scans, the blood work, everything. It was clear. Nothing. No weird diseases, not even a damn deficiency in vitamins. Nothing. But I wasn't satisfied with the answer. I knew something was wrong, and I was going to get to the bottom of it. I called up a local psychologist and made an appointment. Inevitably, that psychologist also gave my husband the all clear. I started to put the whole thing out of my mind, chalking it up to maybe he was just tired. But then it happened again, and it started happening more and more after the therapist's appointment. He would be there, he'd spend time with me, but it wouldn't be him. This wasn't just normal depression or something. It would be like it was somebody else in his body. During one of his lucid moments, I made him take a drug test. It was negative. Eventually, I turned to a friend of mine who's a faith healer, and after going through several other possibilities, no, my husband wasn't faking it, no, my husband didn't have some crazy addiction. The faith healer told me that I might be dealing with something called a skinwalker. A skinwalker is sometimes a witch, sometimes an evil person, but one that has the ability to take the form of any other animal, humans included. I thought he was crazy for even suggesting it, but I was at the end of my rope, with no other options but to believe I did have a skinwalker in my house. So one night I got home early after a movie I was supposed to catch with some friends. The movie had been canceled. I walked into the kitchen, and that was when I saw it. I saw some thing halfway through its transformation into becoming my husband. I screamed bloody murder. The thing looked at me and ran away. The best I could describe it is it was six feet tall, covered in fur like a wolf, and it smelled terrible like death. It had torn clothes stuck to its fur. I was petrified. Thank God the thing ran away from me, because if it had run towards me, I wouldn't have been able to defend myself. As it ran up the stairs, I turned around looking for something to defend myself, and I saw my husband behind me at the door. He asked what was wrong, but I just shoved him out of the house, into the car, and off we took. We ended up at my parents' house, and a few days later, I called the movers to go and get our things. We've never been back to that house. Stanford, Connecticut, February 2016. When I hear myself say it out loud, sometimes even I can't believe it. It sounds so implausible, so far-fetched, but I can't help what I saw, and I think it's almost a duty to let people know, at least make them stay on their guard, to think twice about walking alone or to make sure they travel in groups. It's good advice anyway, but even more now so. If I could at all avoid it, I always tried not to take the last train. Not that the train itself was a problem. They were generally clean and well-maintained, and at that time of night, around 11.30, there was virtually nobody on it. The problem was once you got off. Like most people in my town, I commute every day into the city, and then I return every night, happy to get away from the congestion and pollution of the city. In total, the journey to the city by train takes about 40 minutes, which if you add on getting to and from the station, it's about an hour total. But that isn't too much once you're used to it. The only problem is that if you find yourself late in the city, you have to make sure that you're at the station in time to catch the last train. Then if you manage to catch it, you'll still be faced with a lonely walk home at the other end of it, since the buses are no longer running. So, tonight was that night. I stepped off the train onto the platform and I called goodnight to the ticket collector. I don't know his name, but I see him five nights out of seven. As soon as I stepped off the train and onto the freezing station, I felt the change. The train itself was brightly lit, and though completely deserted other than one other passenger, it felt like it had life in it. By contrast, the station in the winter 
especially at night, feels dead and desolate. There are a few strategically placed lights, but your eyes inevitably need a moment to adjust. And then my walk home involves strolling out of the station, along the platform, and past the tunnel at the end, turning right through the gate and then taking a 10 or 15 minute walk uphill. That night, I didn't even reach the gate. Because of the odd location of my hometown, the last train would pull into the station, and then, rather than continuing along the track in the same direction, it would terminate its service here, reverse, and travel back along the same route it had just taken, heading back to the city. As a result, the tunnel at the end of the tracks through which the train went during the day was dark. On most days, I simply walked past the tunnel without a second thought turning towards home right before I reached it. Only that night, when I heard the sound, I noticed for the first time the strange divide that the tunnel created, how the light from the lamps illuminated the tracks up until a certain point. But once it reached the threshold of the tunnel, the point where you enter, the light basically stopped, almost like a border. And after that, there was new situation one that was filled with darkness. The reason I glanced at the tunnel was the sound, a low, guttural, curdling, something from within the tunnel, within the blackness, growled. I stopped, dead. For a moment I thought it might be a stray dog, that the sound was simply amplified by the echoes caused by the shape of the tunnel. But when I heard it a second time, I knew. That sound wasn't distorted. It was something huge. If it was growling, I thought then clearly it had seen me. I tried to tiptoe to move as quietly and slowly as I could towards the gate. If only I could make it to the gate. I fixed my eyes on the tunnel in the line that separated the light from the darkness, and I watched in horror as one massive paw emerged from the blackness. I ran. Flinging back the gate and dropping my shopping bag, I sprinted up the hill as quickly as I could. My heart was pounding and my breath was catching in my throat until I rounded the corner at the top and then freewheeling downwards, never looking back. The paw itself had scared me, sure. But more than that, it was the shape. The fact that it wasn't like a bear's paw or even a dog's, but rather it seemed like some stretched, fur covered bastardization of a human foot, the only difference as being its massive size, the canine backwards bend and the long arching talons that clawed out from each toe. Once home, I called the station in the city to tell them about the tunnel and to inform them of what I saw. They tried as best as they could to reassure me, but I could hear the disbelief and the weariness in their voices. Next, I tried calling the police and I got a similar response. The following day, I checked every news channel before going down to the station, terrified that I might be met with stories of somebody being maimed or killed by some wild animal. Luckily, when I got there, all was okay. But even in the daylight, the tunnel looked imposing and swallowed the light like it was some massive mouth. I was looking into it when the man at the ticket booth called to me and asked me to come into the back. He told me that he had received a call early in the morning from the city, telling him about my call and asking him to check it out. He said that they had been laughing and they found the whole thing ridiculous. But he, standing on the platform in the early morning when the sun hadn't yet come up, felt the story could really be true. Rather than hopping onto the tracks to take a look or, heaven forbid, going into the tunnel itself, he had instead wound back the security camera footage from the previous night. And now, he was calling me into the booth to show me what he had seen. On the screen, I saw a grainy image of the platform and the tunnel, and of myself walking along it, pausing, and then running at full speed from the station and out of shot. The angle showed nothing from inside the tunnel. I was about to ask about it when the man raised his hand, indicating for me to wait, which I did. After about a minute, I saw it. A great, hulking mass, like a dog, standing on its hind legs but with its bones and spine refashioned to resemble those of a man. The thing stood on two legs, 
Its head reminded me of pictures I had seen of wolves, the ears permanently standing to attention, and the lower jaw hanging slightly open. The image was indistinct and blurry, but it was clear just from the scale that this thing was far bigger than a man. The booth operator stared at me and told me that he had already arranged for the tape to be sent to the station in the city, to the train company headquarters, and to the police. That was three months ago, though I've called numerous times, arranged meetings with staff members, and even inquired with the police. There is no record of that tape. The booth operator swears it was sent to the city and to the head office. The day after that sighting, I changed my shift pattern at work. I no longer take the last train home. Ever. Yosemite National Park, June 2019. My name is Blake, and I want to tell you about an incredible encounter I had in Yosemite National Park. I'd been on a hiking and camping vacation with my family. It was a yearly event for us. This year was Yosemite, and it was a sunny morning the day that this happened. We had started our hike from a trailhead at the base of the mountains. I remember the air being fresh and the sound of chirping birds filling the air. We followed a winding trail that led us deep into the heart of the park. At one point, as we made our way up a steep path, my eyes were darting everywhere. I was on the lookout for signs of animals or anything out of the ordinary. But little did I know that I was about to encounter something truly extraordinary. With all my excitement, I was in the lead and moving more quickly than the rest of the group, by quite a bit of distance, I might add. At one point, I reached a clearing and I started walking towards the center. While I was making my way there, I glanced across the clearing towards the trees on the other side, and suddenly, I froze in my tracks. Standing behind one of the trees, half covered by shadows, about fifty feet away, was a creature that resembled a human, but one that was covered in hair. It was enormous, and as I looked, I could see the face of a dog, and shaggy brown fur, and long, muscular arms. But the creature's eyes were wide and curious, and it stood on two legs just like a human. At first, fear washed over me, and my body felt like it was glued to the ground. But as I studied the creature, I realized that it didn't seem aggressive or dangerous. In fact, it looked just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. The encounter lasted for what felt like an eternity, but it was probably only a few minutes. We stood there, locked in a gaze as if trying to understand each other. As I stood there staring at the creature in awe and disbelief, I couldn't help but notice its immense size. It's all I could think about. It must have been at least eight feet tall and towering over me like a giant. The creature's body was covered in thick, dark brown fur, which blended perfectly with the surrounding trees and the foliage. Its muscular arms hanging by its sides almost touched the ground. At first, my heart raced with fear. The stories I had heard about Bigfoot creatures flashed through my mind, but as I observed the creature more closely, I noticed that it had a gentle expression in its large, round, dark eyes. It seemed curious rather than threatening. The creature then took a step forward, cautiously closing the distance between us. I held my breath, unsure of how it would react. To my surprise, it didn't move any closer. Instead, it just stood there, tilting its head slightly as if trying to understand my presence. Feeling a mixture of fear and fascination, I decided to take a small step backward, hoping to create some distance between us. To my relief, the creature mirrored my movement, showing no signs at all of aggression. It was as if it understood my intentions and didn't want to scare me away. We continued this slow dance, taking turns, stepping back, and observing each other. It was a surreal experience, to say the least. Like being part of a silent conversation between two beings from different worlds. I did feel a sense of connection, a bond formed through our mutual curiosity. 
and the forest around us was hushed, as if holding its breath, creating an atmosphere of enchantment and mystery. It felt like I had entered a different realm, a place where mythical creatures roamed freely. Clearly, my imagination was running wild with this encounter. But despite the fear still lingering within me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of joy. And then with a final glance at the creature, I slowly turned around with my heart pounding in my chest. I then made my way back to where my family was still working their way up the trail. My mind was racing with a mix of emotions. I couldn't wait to share my encounter with them and to describe in vivid detail what had just happened. As I talked, they could see the truth in my eyes. I recounted every detail, from the creature's appearance to our silent communication. They listened intently, hanging on every word. Some were amazed, others were skeptical. But then as a group, we all continued back up to the clearing, but despite all of us looking around, we found no further signs of the creature. The rest of the day passed by in a blur. We concluded our hike as we planned, reaching our campsite just before the sunset. Emotionally, each family member had a different response to my encounter. Some felt a sense of wonder. Others felt a lingering unease, a reminder of the unknown that can lurk in the forest. But we all agreed that it was a day we would never forget. And for me, a day that has affected me deeper than I ever could have imagined.